go through the process of registering a domain. And it actually, depending on how you do it, is actually not that expensive. In fact, some web hosting companies bundle that in as part of their services. In other words, if you subscribe to their hosting company for a year, they'll give you a free domain. Or they'll only charge you $5 to register a domain. But even so, it's not that expensive. All right? It's not that expensive to register uh, a domain. All right? And what that domain does is it effectively maps that name to an IP address. What is an IP address? An IP address are a, a set of four three-digit numbers that identify a computer. And the numbers range from 0 to 255. So you have four numbers from 0 to 255 that identify a computer. Every computer on the internet has an IP address. All right? It's the way that stuff comes back to you. In other words, if, I, if both of us are sitting in lab, for example, and I do a Google search and you do a Google search, well, I'm going to get my results, you're going to get your results. Not going to get confused and send me your results or something like that. How does it do that? Well, because every computer has an IP address. All right? And therefore, um, when a response comes back, it comes back to a specific IP address. All right? So it comes to my machine and, or it goes to your machine. What registering a domain does is it takes your name, www.yahoo.com, www.google.com, whatever, and corresponds it to the IP address of your web server. So, all of these web servers have an IP address. So do these clients. What a domain name server does is it associates a name with an IP address. Because it's easier for people to remember names instead of a series of four-digit numbers. You know, who knows what the IP address is for Google? You know, no, one, no one knows that off the top of their head, unless you're an engineer for Google. All right? Um, but you do know Google.com. That's easy to remember. All right? And the registering organization makes sure that it's unique, makes sure that there aren't two people that have that. All right? And it then goes and maps your domain name to your IP address of your web server. All right? If you change hosting companies later on, you have to make a change then to your domain. And you have to tell your domain, no, don't use this web, web hosting company's IP address. Use this web hosting company's IP address. All right? When you register a website or make a change to a website, there's actually a series of computers around the world that keep track. One thing that's built into the internet is, is redundancy, right? So there isn't simply one machine that keeps track of what domains belong to what IP address. Because that would make the internet very vulnerable to hackers. If the hackers were to knock out that machine, or if that machine were sabotaged or whatever, then that would kill the internet. So there's a bunch of machines that keep track of the domains and the IP addresses that belong to those domains. And those are called domain name servers. Now, when you make a change, when you register a domain, or make a change to a domain, it's not necessarily instantly available. All right? It will become available maybe after a day. And actually, you can actually, through one internet connection, you might see your change. Through another internet connection, you might not see the change. So if you created a brand new domain and loaded your web pages, you might be able to access it at home, but not here at school. Because the domain name servers that are used at home might be different than the ones that LC uses here, um, that, that LC's internet, um, uh, internet uh, provider uses here. So, 
typically within a few hours to a day, those changes get propagated and everyone in the world then will have the updated domain name servers. So, sort of to summarize this, is that to put yourself live, what you need to do is first of all, create a domain and register that domain. Second thing you need to do is um, you, would, you would typically um, go and, and subscribe to a internet, uh, a web hosting company, all right? And they would give you access to a server or to part of a server and a mechanism to upload your files there. You would upload your files there and after the domain change went through all the domain name servers, your site would be live. So register a domain, subscribe to a web hosting service, upload your files. If you needed to change your website, you would upload the revised files to that. Some organizations, again, provide all those services, like GoDaddy will register the domain for you and provide you web hosting and so on. Uh, uh, if you've registered the domain some other way, then you can still use it with other web hosting services. You might just have to go through a little bit more of a process to, to do that. Any questions about that process? Yes? Is it possible to host your own server? It is possible to host your own web server. Absolutely. Um, Again, the reason that most organizations don't do it is because um, they don't want to be bothered with the hassle of like especially keeping track of security updates and that sort of thing. All right. Um, so are you mostly paying for like the web hosting service to be security That's a big part of what you're 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 doing, yes. Okay. Yeah, right. Um, that, that's a big part of what you're doing is that, that a hosting service, um, you know, uh, for troubleshooting, for um, securing the, the, the website, um, and, and for the space, you know, the space is a consideration too, and for that. It, it's just like, it's one of those things like, it would be like, you know, um, all of us probably could, could learn how to change our own oil in our car, right? But some people do it. But most people is like, well, you know what? It's a pain. I'm just going to take it and pay the however much once every three months and, and get it done for me. So it, it's, it's sort of a case of you could do it. It's not that hard, but it's kind of more trouble than it's worth. Yeah. Um, Again, when you're researching web hosting companies, the one thing I would look for is, is typically they publish like downtime, like what percentage of the time their server is down. And of course, the lower that downtime is, the better the service is. Also, you know, research, look in forums and stuff and look at, at what the customer service is like. You know, so if you do have a problem, um, that you can, you can go in uh, and do that. So yeah, uh, most, most organizations, I would say, there might be some larger ones that maintain their own web server, all right, that, that have a substantial IT staff and, and can devote the time to it. But I would think most of them would, you know, it's like a utility almost. You know, you're not going to generate your own electricity. You know, you're, you're going to just tap into a utility um, and, and, and let them do their job. Other questions? Now, I mentioned directories, and now's probably a good time as any to talk about directories. Um, so far, I've encouraged people to put everything in one directory. Just put your CSS file, put your images, put your web pages, put everything all in one folder. <laughs> Sounds like we're blasting off here. Uh, but... Uh, just like on your own machine at home, if you had everything in one folder, that would be a pain to find stuff, right? So what, you, what do you do? You organize your folder. So you might have a person, you know, in your My Documents folder on your machine at home, you might have personal and school. In school, you might have a folder for each semester. And each semester, you might have a different folder for each class. And that way, you can easily find stuff. It's just more organized. And you can do the same thing with files on a web page. So I'm going to pull down an example that we did 
um, a few weeks back. And I'm going to change it around a little bit to use folders to organize it. Oh, I don't know. This is weird. Is this one of them sci-fi moments? That maybe, that maybe this is me from the future coming to warn me about something. No, I think this one's professor in this school. Oh. Wow. Is my mic on? Yeah, it's on. Wow. All righty, let's pull up. Let's go back to our Olympic one. I think this will have stuff in it. All right, here we go. We have our page. All right, we have our page. We have our CSS file, and we have some images. All right. Generally speaking, in the in the root of the um, of the website, you will typically have your web pages. If you have a very large website, you might have sections of your website, and you might have folders for each of the sections. Um, but you probably would have your home page and maybe some other files in what's called the root of the website. That's sort of like the home directory. When I logged into my website um, using the control panel, it put me automatically, when I, type, when I clicked on public HTML, that was my web server's root. And root is like ground zero for that website. That's like the starting point of everything. All right, so I'm going to keep my HTML files in here. And I'm going to move these images and CSS files into their own folder. So I'm going to create two folders. First one I'm going to create is called style. And I'm going to move the style sheet into it. So now when I do that, of course, the style sheet doesn't apply anymore. Why doesn't the style sheet apply anymore? Because this web page is looking for the style sheet in a file called main CSS. And because there's no folder in front of main CSS, it assumes that's in the same folder as the web page is. Well, that's where it was a minute ago, but I've since moved it into a folder called style. So, to access that, I would simply put the name of the folder and a slash in front of it. So I'd say style slash main.css. And now if I go and view it, it can find the style sheet again. Notice it's not showing the Olympics rings anymore. We'll get to that in a minute. 
I can do the same thing with images. So I'm going to create a new folder for images. And I'm going to put the picture of the basketball team and a picture of the Olympic rings in the images folder. So notice how clean this is. My root folder has just my HTML pages in it. I then have a folder for images and a folder for style. So for small websites, that's probably a good way to organize stuff. All right, keep everything separated by file type. That way, if you need to find images, you can find them. This is also valuable if, for example, you were allowed, if you were going to allow different people maybe to upload images but not upload web pages or something like that. Because you, you could give access to one of the folders and, and not give access to, the, to another folder. So that possibly could be something that's beneficial. All right. For example, in Canvas, all right, that would be a good example. Right? You can upload files to the Canvas server right, by when, you, when you turn in your assignment. Now, there, I'm sure there's a directory that those files go into. And you have permission to upload to those files, but you don't have permission to access places elsewhere on the Canvas server because they wouldn't want you inadvertently messing up their web pages or whatever. So by separating things into folders, it can also uh, be beneficial as far as uh, applying security to the website. But now, again, the image is broken. All right, we're not seeing the image anymore. All right, so what we have to do is go in and do the same thing. Say, where's the, yeah, put the folder name in. So if it's in a folder underneath, the web page, you simply put the folder name in and then a slash. Notice that that is a forward slash and not a backslash. That's important. A, a backslash will work in some cases, but on some browsers it won't necessarily work. And on some web servers it won't necessarily work. So therefore use the forward slash. And now Bam, it's working again. Yes? So, so the address, address um, after the image from? Yeah, um, the, the address, like, what is it? What's that in the same thing? Oh, on, uh, on uh, this? Yes. Yeah, absolutely. So, in other words, from NBC Sports' Olympic site, from their root directory, they have a folder called 2016. They have a subfolder called 07. They have a subfolder called 15. They have a folder called US Men Still Strong Olympic Basketball. Okay, so yes, all of those are folders. Exactly. Now, we have one little catch in here. And we can solve that two different ways. If we look at our style sheet, we're not seeing the background file. All right. So probably the easiest way to correct this, or there'd be two ways to correct this. One way would be to move the file in the same folder as the style sheet. Because again, there's no folder in front of the style sheet, uh, or I'm sorry, there's no folder in front of the image name, so it assumes that the image is in the same folder as the style sheet is. So I could go and paste it in there. And the rings are back. All right, so that would be one option. A second option would be to keep this in the images folder and just specify how to get from the style folder to the images folder. Now, 
directory listings, sometimes they call them trees. Because they, they can be sort of drawn like a tree. Actually, they're sort of drawn like a tree where, the, where that's upside down, where the roots on the top and the branches go down. So in other words, here's my root folder. I have underneath it a branch for style and a branch for images. If any of you had the operating system class, CISS 125, in that class you might have done things like change directory and then do something like dot dot slash directory name. All right? Dot dot refers to going up a directory. So to go up a directory you use a dot dot. To go down a directory you use a directory name. One thing you can't do is leap across the tree like this. You can only go up or down. You can't go across. So to get from style to images, you'd have to first go up to the root directory and down to the images directory. The way that's represented is by doing this. Dot, dot. That will take us from the style folder up to the root folder. Slash images that will take us down to the images folder. And it still works. So your two choices would be to have your images that are associated with your style sheet file, keep those in the style folder, and then just use the name of the file. The other option would be to keep all of your images in the images folder, and then use the, from the style to the images, use dot dot slash images to get from here to there. And either one of those are acceptable answers. Now notice again how organized we are. We have our web pages in a folder, we have everything, uh, our, all our style sheets in a folder, and we have all our images in a folder. As we add more and more stuff to our website, you know, things like JavaScript files and so on, we can add more folders. As our website gets bigger, you know, if this was, let's say, really NBC Sports website, we could have, just like they showed, have a folder for Olympics, have a folder for football, have a folder for basketball. Underneath basketball, you could have a folder for pro basketball and college basketball. And underneath pro basketball, you could have a folder for the NBA and the WNBA and so on down the line. So depending how big the site is, you can subdivide it into folders. Just like depending on how many files you have on your machine at home would determine how many folders that you had. So for example, if you typically only took one class per semester, you might not have a separate folder for each class. You could just put everything in the semester folder. But if you took five classes, you might want to break it down and have a different folder for that. So how many files you have sort of determine how, how finely you're going to subdivide the stuff on there. All right. These are two topics that I wanted to talk about for a while and, and now have an opportunity to do so. All right. The next main topic relates to mobile websites. All right. And we'll talk about this today. We'll, we'll get introduced with that and we'll polish this off on Monday. All right. Um, I certainly don't need to tell you um, the popularity of mobile devices and, and um, these days. Um, that's, that's obvious, right? Um, someone could view this on a mobile device, exactly. Um, you know, even three, four years ago, you know, mobile was important, but not to the degree it is now. I mean, there's some people who that probably spend as much or more time accessing the web via a mobile device as opposed to um, a website. All right? And there's different things come into play when you develop on a website. First of all, there's things such as the physical limitation of the screen. The screen is typically going to be smaller. Not necessarily smaller in terms of pixels, but smaller in terms of physical size. So that's something to be aware of. 
you are liable to be on a slower connection on a mobile device. Not always, but you're liable to be if you're using like 4G to connect it as opposed to a wireless connection or definitely a wired connection, then you're apt to be slower on a mobile device. Physically, the screen is smaller as far as clicking links. I know I have that problem on mobile sites. I go to click on one link, and if the links aren't spaced out or big enough, I'll click like the link next to it. All right? So the physical limitation of the phone. Another difference is people tend to browse the web on mobile devices differently than they do on a desktop device. For example, uh, and this is a bad example because LC's mobile website is identical to its regular website, which is unfortunate. All right? But what might be something that you would browse the mobile site for? Well, let me just tell you what I mean instead of beating around the bush. All right? Users access mobile sites for different reasons than they access the desktop site. If I was investigating and if I was planning out, if I was trying to decide on what to major in, in other words, I sort of have a big task. I'm going to be there a while and I'm going to sit and I'm going to like look at what the alternatives for majors are. Let's say I'm interested in computers but I don't know exactly what to major in. That's sort of a big task. That would probably be better suited for browsing on the desktop, right? Because you can sit down, you can take notes, you can, um, you know, search, you can click on something, think about it, and so on and so forth. Copy and paste stuff over to a Word document, whatever. If I'm accessing Elsie's website from a mobile device, I may be looking for a very immediate answer to a question. What are the library's hours? What Zeller's email address? Is campus closed today because of snow? Um, questions such as that. So people that access a organization's webs a mobile website are apt to have different goals than their desktop site. Everything is more quicker, more summarized, less detail very specifically targeted. Therefore, making a mobile version of your site is not necessarily simply making a smaller version of your regular site, shrinking it down and putting it on the screen. There's different design rules. And the design rules tend to be to make things simpler, simpler layouts. I mentioned when we were talking about using CSS to design the layouts of, of pages that multi-column will work fine on a desktop machine but won't necessarily look very good on a mobile phone. Therefore, single column layouts are good on a, on a mobile device, whereas multi-column might be better on a desktop device. More focused on sort of higher level, quicker summary stuff. I go to CNN's website, I'm not necessarily going to be doing extensive research if I go access it via the mobile. I may just want to see what the headlines are. You know, tracking the hurricane or tracking the election or whatever. I might just want to see what the latest headlines are relating to that. I'm not necessarily going to spend tons of time researching and looking and so on. If I go to LC's website, I might want to look up someone's phone number, look up the hours for something look up um, if campus is closed. So you tend to be a little more focused when you're accessing it via a mobile site than when you're accessing it via a desktop site. Generally there are three strategies for developing your mobile site. One of them is to create A one-size-fits-all fit, website. And that might not be as hard as it sounds if you have a simple enough website. If, for example, you had a, did a website for a restaurant 
Think of what likely is going to be on a website for a restaurant. You're not going to have tons of pages, probably not. You might just have uh, a home page that says where you're located, what kind of uh, food you serve, maybe a menu, uh, maybe customer reviews, maybe a contact us page. You might only have a handful of pages. All right. You could design using the techniques we talked about, specifically using floating uh, sections of the page and using relative sizes of things, in other words, using percentages instead of pixels. You could probably develop a website that looked great on a desktop device as well as looking good on a mobile phone. So with a simple enough website, this is a possibility. All right, to just develop a website and create one CSS file that looks good under both. Your second option is to have one HTML file or set of files and multiple CSS files. So you have the same content. All right, essentially the same content, you just format it differently. You might do that if you wanted a very precise layout for a desktop, but wanted a, a, a far more simple layout for a mobile device. This is still better than developing two different websites altogether, though, right? Because you're still using the same content. You're still using the HTML. You're just developing a second style sheet to make it display a little bit differently on a mobile device versus, versus um, a desktop device. The third option is to have two separate websites. If you have a complicated website, a big website, it might be impossible to have use the same HTML on both of them because simply it's too involved, uh, the desktop version is too involved than uh, as compared to the um, mobile version. I'm trying to find an example of this. Um, shoot. I'm not texting my friend. I'm actually looking for some. Oh, here's a good example, eBay. All right, notice if I go to eBay on the desktop machine. Notice what the URL says, www.ebay.com. If I go to eBay on a mobile device, It's going to be hard to read. Let me try to zoom in. Notice that the URL is different. It says m.ebay.com. What that means is eBay has two versions of their site. It has a desktop version and it has a mobile version. And how do you accomplish that? There is On the server, there's a piece of code written in server-side scripting that's essentially a traffic cop that looks to see what kind of device has requested that page. And if a desktop device has requested that page, it sends them to the desktop version. If a mobile device has requested it, it sends it to the mobile version. Next week, we're going to talk about these two things and what we can do to make these two things work. This, 
We don't talk about, in this class, because we don't talk about server-side scripting. Whoops. We'll talk about the first two, the one-size-fits-all and one HTML with multiple CSS. We won't talk about two totally separate uh, uh, websites <coughs> with a traffic cop. Um, anyone that takes this class might be interested in taking CISS 268, which is mobile web developing, where we discuss these mobile issues in more detail. All right, where we would cover how to write server-side scripting to look and see what kind of device is requesting the web page and then sending them to a different web page depending on the kind of device. But we will talk about these two things next week. All right, any questions? We'll see you up in lab. <laughs>